Unless you've been living under a rock, you might have noticed that Spike seltzers are everywhere. White Claw, Vizzy, Truly, High Noon, you name it. The business of Spike drinks is booming, but it would seem that only recently we're seeing products like Coke and Jack Daniels and Hard Mountain Dew hitting the shelves. Which is weird because soda and liquor have always been a classic combo. Rum and Coke, Jack and Coke, 7 and 7, Whiskey Ginger, Vodka Red Bull. So why is Big Soda just now jumping on the Spike drinks train? Now, technically, canned cocktails have been around since as far back as the late 1800s, when a couple of hoteliers in Hartford, Connecticut, the Hubline brothers, were asked to bottle a bunch of Manhattans and martinis for a fancy outdoor picnic. Though the picnic was canceled, when a bartender opened one of these bottles a few weeks later, he found that it still tasted pretty good. And boom, a new business was born. Canned cocktails really peaked in popularity in the 1950s. But for whatever reason, they fell out of popularity, and in the 1990s, canned cocktails really hit a low. But in 2016, beer sales began to dip, and that's partly because White Claw and Truly were released that year. These alcoholic seltzers took the world by storm, and their sales grew 283% from 2018 to 2019, even leading to nationwide shortages in the US. And what made these spiked seltzers especially clever is that they weren't actually vodka soda in a can the way they appeared. They were in fact malted beverages, brewed in a similar way to beer and with a beer-like alcohol content that allowed them to be taxed at a lower beer tax rate rather than a mixed cocktail rate. More on these tax rates later. Beverage brands took notice, and soon everyone was launching their own hard seltzer. It's a JC Penny. The department store? Yeah, they're doing hard seltzers now. What flavor is it? Men's jackets? Sales of hard seltzers and ready-to-drink cocktails were valued at nearly $10 billion in 2021, and they're expected to keep growing exponentially for a while. Even Big Beer didn't miss out, producing their own alcoholic seltzers in an effort to retain market share. And now other non-alcoholic beverage companies seem to be in the game. We have Sunny D vodka seltzers, Vita Coco spiked with Captain Morgan, Dunkin' Donuts is launching a line of boozy coffee and tea. Even Eggo Waffles is somehow cashing in on the trend. But again, we must ask, what took Big Soda so long? Why are they just now catching up? There was a general notion in the food and beverage industry that if a sunny, non-alcoholic brand were to suddenly associate itself with alcohol, which, remember, is sinful, it would harm the brand's image. On top of that, because of the complicated legal rules around alcohol, which vary state to state, it seemed like too much of a hassle to produce some alcoholic beverages. Because ultimately, they might not even be able to compete with the already popular beer and spiked seltzers anyway. And why was it so hard to launch an alcoholic beverage in the first place? Well, there was this little stretch of history from 1920 to 1933 known as Prohibition. You may have heard of it. And it put a bit of a damper on alcohol production for a while. And by that, I mean it put a complete halt to the legal production of it. But even after Prohibition ended, there were more federal rules around the making and selling of alcohol than there were before. And one of the hallmark after effects of Prohibition that we still see today is the high excise tax on the production of of alcohol. These taxes placed on alcohol producers are also known as corrective or sin taxes because they're partly designed to discourage the consumption of alcohol. Tax rates vary state to state, but generally across the U.S., hard liquor is taxed at the highest rate, followed by wine, then beer, which is taxed at the lowest rate because of its lower alcohol content. Which, again, is why White Claw is so clever. It's able to be packaged and sold under the illusion of being a canned vodka soda while actually being taxed at the cheaper rate of beer. But after the incredible boom that White Claw truly created, the market opportunity for alternative ready-to-drink cocktails seemed too good to pass up. Plus, soft drink sales have been on the gradual decline since the late 90s, partly because of consumer preference references towards healthier choices. So companies like Coca-Cola and Pepsi were already likely looking around for other sources of revenue. And as it turns out, Coke CEO James Quincy was already dipping his toes in the trend. In 2018, Coke saw that Chew High drinks, which were low alcohol cocktails mixed with soda, were popular in Japan. So the company jumped on the opportunity to create one of their own called Lemon Dew. It was so successful that they eventually expanded to offer the product in China and the Philippines as well. In 2020, Coke partnered with Molson Coors to launch a hard seltzer with their brand Topo Chico in the U.S. Later, Coke dropped spiked Simply Juices and partnered with Jack Daniels to bring a classic to life. And by licensing their trademarks to established liquor brands like Jack Daniels, Constellation Brands, and Molson Coors, Coke was able to stay within the complicated regulations that normally separate alcohol producers, distributors, and retailers. And Pepsi? They've jumped into the spiked beverages market with Hard Mountain Dew, which they launched in partnership with Boston Beer. They also set up a wholly owned subsidiary, Blue Cloud Distribution, in order to launch other products like Lipton Hard Iced Tea. But this involved 
involves the more expensive task of hiring 250 employees, buying a whole new fleet of trucks, and acquiring individual state licenses in order to distribute these new alcoholic offerings. On top of this hurdle, Pepsi's Blue Cloud distribution has so far been denied licenses in Georgia, Kentucky, and Indiana. But these types of hurdles aren't slowing down the competition. It seems almost every beverage company is now also gunning for their share of the thriving ready-to-drink market. The question now is, can big soda brands like Coke and Pepsi keep up? Brands like White Claw have already established a strong identity in the space, and flavored malt beverages made up the greatest share of sales within the ready-to-drink category, with $4.4 billion in U.S. sales over the past 12 months, which is a 21% increase from last year. Plus, soda brands have the extra hurdle that soft drinks are already facing, and by now, most of America recognizes that soda equals corn syrup and excess sugar, which equals weight gain and all the negative health effects that come with that. So given the choice in the store, will a millennial really reach for a Jack and Coke or over the seemingly healthier option of a spiked seltzer? Only time will tell. Ready-to-drink beverages, including premixed cocktails, flavored malt beverages, and hard seltzers saw $10.9 billion in U.S. sales over the past 12 months. With the ongoing staffing shortages facing a lot of the restaurant and hospitality industry, the ease of ready-to-drink cocktails makes sense. They also make bar lines move faster and are super convenient in venues like stadiums where setting up an entire bar seems impractical. Within the entire ready-to-drink category, market share for premixed cocktails has grown to 31 1.2% and is still going strong. So the real question that remains is when are we getting spiked Kool-Aid? Does the mic look like it's clipped weird? This shirt has like a really high neck. The beanbag chairs are super weird. Which way should I? Yeah, that's definitely better.